Okay. So, good morning, DevOps Days Philadelphia. My name is Maddie Stratton. I am a DevOps advocate at PagerDuty. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Matt Stratton. Please feel free to engage with my brand. Uh, <laughs> today, we're going to talk about how you can infect your organization with humane ops. Now, first, just a little bit of background about me. I'm not a big fan of resume slides, but when talking about something like this, there's some relevant experience that I've had. There's some things that I do. Usually, you know, I like to show off something at the end, so we'll do that. But anyway, so I'm a DevOps advocate at PagerDuty. Uh, that means that I talk to people about DevOps and why DevOps is amazing. Sometimes I call myself a human ops ad advocate in terms of that this idea of humane ops and human ops is a big part of what uh, we do at PagerDuty. I am a podcaster uh, at Arrested DevOps. Uh, we are in the process of trying to change our logo to make it so you understand what that actually ADO stands for. But anyway, if you like podcasts, check us out. We talk about DevOps stuff. I'm one of the organizers and creators of DevOps Days Chicago. Uh, and I'm also a member of the DevOps, global, DevOps Days um, global team. So uh, anything that you love about the website and how it works, thank you. Everything you hate about it, that was probably Tim's fault somehow. And uh, finally, back when I did have a car, I did have the license plate that said DevOps. Um, to be fair, I still have the license plate, I just don't have a car on it. But this is the reason that I kind of illustrate this is that this is something that's been near and dear to my heart. It's an area that I work in a lot. I've spent, uh, before I was involved with the DevOps movement, I spent about 20 years as a system administrator for lots of different organizations. So I have a lot of organizational <laughs> scar tissue of my own when it comes to things like on-call, and operations. So, how many of you have been in a situation where it's the middle of the night and you're on some kind of a phone bridge and you're just trying to solve problems with fellow humans? Okay, uh, keep your hands up if you super love that and want to do it all the time. Yeah. So, uh, being on call can be pretty stressful. We've done some research at PagerDuty around um, on call, surprise, surprise, and I want to share a little bit of the data that we've learned with you. Um, first, though, as I did my own little data searching, and I asked Twitter to describe on-call in three words, because this is how I source talks. Um, my favorite of this was, uh, you know, in the end, which was uh, Emily Freeman saying, a dumpster fire. <laughs> Emily has also pointed out at this point that one of her KPIs is to be featured, have her or her mother featured in at least two of my talks per quarter, because I have another talk where I, you know, talk about stuff about, um, that her mom has said to us. But, so what we can see is that uh, on-call is not delightful for most people. When I ask you what on-call feels like, nobody says things like super awesome, a giant hug, or you know, solving cool problems. But the thing is, to me, it, that's where it can sound like. So we did, uh, we did a survey across uh, incident responders. So these was a survey around, we looked at 50,000 responders, and they were receiving a total of 760 million incidents when it was the, over the course of what we were surveying. So this is three quarters of a billion incidents, over 50,000 responders, lots and lots of data. We love data, data makes for science. So these are the things we saw. Of those notifications, 60 million of them occurred during dinner hours. 82 million of them happened during evening hours, just in general, right? We had 250 million of those notifications were during sleeping hours. That kind of sucks. And 122 million of them occurred during weekends, which meant that we had a total of three quarters of a million nights with sleep interrupting notifications is a thing that we found. Now, this is not delightful, right? And then also, sorry, I always forget this last bullet. 330,000 weekend days with interrupt notifications. I guess I'm more concerned with having my sleep interrupted than my weekend interrupted, but normal people probably like to have their weekends free too. So none of this is probably, none of this really comes as a big surprise to anybody. Like when I show this slide, especially at a DevOps days, everybody kind of has the knowledgeable, yep, yep, sounds about right, sounds about right. You know, so now let's take those numbers and let's figure out about why they matter. So we were really concerned, we were curious about what causes people to change their job. Right? So we, we looked across these responders and we talked to people that had changed roles, had switched to another job in the last 18 months. And a lot of times, conventional wisdom says, why do people change jobs? Hey, more money, right? That's usually a lot. People go somewhere else, gonna get paid more. More interesting work. Or one that gets trotted out a lot, and I still believe to be generally true, many people have heard the phrase, you don't quit your job, you quit your manager. 
right? And that can be true. Now, what we found, though, that the most meaningful metrics on attrition when it comes to people who are incident responders in technology were this. The number of days when their work and life were interrupted, the number of days when they're woken overnight, and the number of weekend days that are interrupted by notifications. It doesn't mean that just because this happens, someone's going to leave their job. But these were numbers, that there were actual numbers that we hit, where like if we could see that if, if someone was interrupted by this amount of time, and within a certain period of time, they were more likely to find another job. Why does this matter? Well, we're going to talk a lot about why being humane and making on-call better is a good thing. And some of this is going to be because, you know what, these are fellow humans that we work with, and we should make their life better because we're not evil, terrible humans, right? However. If you are an evil, terrible human, or you don't care about being an evil, terrible human, let's just talk about money. The average cost to replace a software engineer or an SRE is $300,000. So this is a pretty easy way to save yourself some money. So we'll talk a little bit about the idea of a meme. So this is Richard Dawkins. He's uh, the guy who coined the term meme. Um, so memes are things like they could be tunes, they could be ideas, catchphrases, fashions like steampunk tights. Um, Ways of making pots, that, 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 that joke did not land. Uh, <laughs> but if we think about how genes, genes propagate themselves in our gene pool from going from body to body, ideas in the form of a meme go from, idea to, uh, from person to person, right? Brain to brain via imitation. We sometimes, when we talk about things going viral, they're really a meme. Um, interesting side note, so the first time I gave this talk was at DevOps Day Salt Lake City which has a very high Mormon population. Richard Dawkins is a very famous atheist. I went past this slide really fast. <laughs> so I promised a little bit of a conversation about Snow Crash. How many people have read the book Snow Crash? How many people have not read this book Snow Crash but are intending to? Or maybe in the middle of it and don't want me to spoil it too bad that we just talked about before the talk. So the good thing is there's not really any major spoilers about this. But when... Uh, we think about this, memes are another way of evolving across generations. So this happens in the world of the book of Snow Crash, and it can happen in your organization. So in Snow Crash, the kind of eponymous Snow Crash is a neuro-linguistic virus. That's like a first 50-page spoiler. Um, the bad guys, they, they're working on unlocking it, and they're spreading it from hacker to hacker like a meme. So this is something that's happening in people's brains, and they're ha going from, from brain to brain like a meme. And there's also a lot of swordplay. It's super rad. It's a really great steampunk, uh, cyberpunk book. But the part that matters is this, this comment that the author, Neil Stevenson, has said, which is that ideology is a virus. The way that we think about things is a virus. And it goes from person to person through imitation. And I want you to think about it. I'm going to say it again. It goes from person to person through imitation. So when we think about ways that we can make things better in our organization, we want people to imitate the things that we do that are successful. Because you know what? They're going to, because people like to be successful. So I'm going to talk about this from a couple different perspectives, right? Because different people have different roles in organizations. A lot of time when I'll talk about organizational change, people will say, well, you know what? I'm not the supreme leader. I'm not the CTO. I'm not the CIO. I'm just an individual contributor. How can I affect change? Or I'm a middle manager, I lead a team, but I don't lead the whole organization. Or they may even say, I am the CTO. How can I make change? So I'm going to talk about it from different perspectives. But to be honest, we're going to spend most of the time in the non-supreme leader stage, because I don't think this is a room full of CIOs, because you're all way, way, way too good looking. Um, apologies to any CIOs who want to hire me, ever. So if you are, though, in, in kind of a, a senior level management role, some of the things you can do to make on-call and operations more humane is to understand, first and foremost, that this idea of command and control doesn't work. Command and control is this model of, I'm up here at the top, and we're going to delegate orders all the way down. Right? We're going to tell you what to do. Go walk 20 paces to that hill, walk up the hill, pull out your, your revolver, wave it around at the bad guys, and do whatever you kind of think. You're going to already see how this is ridiculous, right? There's a reason that, the mili that no military uses command and control anymore, nor has for over 100 years, because it doesn't work. Instead, we use, there's this idea of, we might call it maneuver warfare, which is outcome-based. I'm going to say, this is the outcome that I want. 
right? And that's hopefully one of the last military metaphors that I'll use. We use a lot of them here um, in IT, and we're gonna try to avoid them because again, command and control doesn't work. This is a big one, use measurement for good, not for evil. So I'll give you an example. We do um, some work at PagerDuty where we've seen things like we can identify uh, that people are becoming burnt out by how long it takes for them to respond to a page, to an alert. So when you're starting to get burnt out, your phone goes off, doo -doo 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 -doo, and you sit there, and if you're burnt out, are you jumping right on that call, or are you procrastinating? Are you, these are all indicators, right? Well, that same indicator could be used, I can either look at that and I can say, wow, okay, hey, Ren, it looks like you're responding to pages more slowly, how you doing? Are you getting burned out? Or I could sit there and I could say, hey, Tim, you're responding to pages more slowly, I'm putting you on a performance plan, right? So think about how these, this measurement can be used to help accelerate your business and help take care of your people. Another thing is remember that people will work to the metrics you give them. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about this idea of understanding severity of incidents. But one of the things that happens during a call, how many people have been on an incident call before where most of the time is arguing about whether or not it's a SEV1 or a SEV2, right? I call that a metric that is called mean time to innocence. Right? We are trying to figure out how quickly we can point out that we didn't screw up. And the reason that that happens is because we are an organization that is being measured by how many SEV ones we have this month. Right? So if I'm saying, I know we're doing a good job because we don't have a lot of SEV ones, then people's main goal in life is proving that that wasn't a SEV one, it was a SEV two, it's cool, it's fine, who cares? The site's down, right? And then finally, avoid this idea of executive swoop during incidents. Um, which is, looks a little something like this, right? So kind of when you're on a call, an executive gets on and says things like, hey, have you tried doing this? Why aren't you doing this? I want this fixed in the next 10 minutes, go! Right, so these are all ways you can stay out of the way um, if you're an executive uh, type person. But now we might be getting more to some more relevant uh, roles. So more kind of middle management, uh, if you will. Team leads, team managers. What are some of the things you can do in that case? So one is to encourage safe post-incident review spaces. We need to have this ability that after something goes pear-shaped, that we're gonna look at it and we're gonna understand what happened. But those spaces have to be safe. And they have to be safe in terms of that they're a culture of learning. We need to feel like we can volunteer whatever information we have because it's not gonna be turned around and used to screw us over later, right? So we talk about blameless post-mortems, things like that. Those are all very, very important. And then driving for a culture of learning, I'm gonna talk about things you can do for a culture of learning in a few slides. But this is really, really important to have this idea, right? So it's, uh, if people are up, and the, the other thing finally is to take care of your people, right? So if people are up in the middle of the night, give them some comp time to recover. But remember, it's gotta be within the next like 24 hours or maybe 48 hours at the most. And the reason is this comp time is not a reward, right? This is a, you were up all night, go get some sleep, you, right? So you can come back and do your job. And maybe it's, come, okay, maybe because of timing, you're gonna get it in the afternoon or whatever. Or maybe it has to be a day later because there's some meeting or something, I don't know. The problem that happens a lot of times when we do this comp time that gets added up, so if we say, okay, since Jason, since you were up all night, we're gonna let you take an extra vacation day this year. Two bad things happen. One is Jason is certainly not gonna use that time to recover. Right, he's gonna use it to have some extra vacation. If he's lucky enough to even take vacation at all, right? Second of all, the message that's going there is you are getting a reward for being a hero. Good job at being up in the middle of the night. Here is your medal. And we want to not, this is not something we want to reward. We want to avoid, right? We wanna we want say we're gonna take care of you if you had to do something that sucked, but we're not gonna give you a prize. And then, so we're gonna talk about a culture of learning. What are the things that matter when, when it comes to this? So, what we wanna think about is in a generative, performance-oriented organization, failure leads to inquiry. If we don't treat every outage or alert as something to learn from or something to improve, we run the risk of something called normalization of deviance, which means we start to accept alerts and degradations as acceptable, and talk about that but you don't have to take my word for it about generative performance-oriented organizations. A fellow named Ron Westrom has done an awful lot of data science about this. Uh, so has Dr. Nicole Forsgren. So you can ask them. 
And there, there's a, don't worry, I'm going to give you a link at the end that you can find all the links I'm going to refer to, but there's a lot of background information um, from the Westrom model. But failure leads to inquiry. Uh, John Cowie, who is currently a chef, but at the time I talked to him, he was working at Etsy. He was on my podcast and he had a really great, one of, one of my favorite little sayings. He said, it's amazing what you can accomplish when the only thing that happens when you make a mistake is you learn new things. Those are powerful words. They're hard to do in an organization. Don't get me wrong. I know it's really easy for me to stand up here on stage and say, let's just learn from everything. But we're here to have a culture of learning. Um, I like to say, use the force even if you aren't a Jedi. So our, our, our boy Finn here is not a Jedi, but he can still wield the lightsaber, mostly. So just because something is outside of your job description doesn't mean you uh, need to avoid trying to make it better. And this is when we talk about the individual contributors. This is when it's the things that those of us that are doing the real work, that aren't the bosses, that aren't the big bosses, even though our remit is not to go transform the organization into a performative, generative, amazing thing, it's to go write some code, we can still do things to be transformative. So we're gonna talk about a few of what those are. So one is review all the things. Um, the, the reference of this, this picture here, because it doesn't always come up, but I really like it, is this was uh, an Empire Strikes Back when they couldn't find the Millennium Falcon because it was hiding right behind them. So, Always be looking, right? So um, Andy Fleener, who's a platform operations manager at Sports Engine, has said, you know, we review every alert from the last 24 hours or over the weekend to uh, avoid any broken windows. We need to know everything that's happening. So we talk about these, we sometimes call them operational reviews. They're totally a thing. I'm not gonna go into the great detail about them. If you wanna learn more about them, if you go to reviews.pagerduty.com, we've open sourced some documentation on how to do operational reviews. Um, there's business-related ones, there's service-related ones, but there's some specific ones related to on-call that we have at reviews.pageduty.com. So talk some more about normalization of deviance, right? So this is this gradual process through which uh, things that are unacceptable become acceptable. As this deviant behavior is repeated without catastrophic outcome, it becomes a social norm for the organization. How many people have been in that scenario where like, well, that test is always red, that's the thing that happens, whatever, we move on. Um, I had a fun experience in one uh, place I was at where we had a web service that threw 14,000 alerts a second that were false positives. There was nothing wrong with it. Well, we just sort of started ignoring it. Guess what would happen if anything ever really went wrong with that web service? We don't know. So this is called normalization of deviance. This happens in our IT organizations, it can happen in our larger organizations, it can happen within our cultures. It's happened to NASA, don't feel bad, it happened to them twice. And there's some background about that, the space shuttle disasters were from normalization of deviance, from things that were like, okay, well this always looks like this, we'll just let it go. And by no means am I trivializing what happened, nobody sat there and just said, oh, whatever, I don't care, but Normalization of deviance means that these things that look like no big deal because we're used to them. And again, in this case, we start to accept alerts or service degradation as acceptable. And this is a link to the, the, the article about the um, NASA experiences with normalization of deviance. Always question your metrics. We do a lot of, how many people, we've, have we talked about CAMS yet or COMS? I think we're just DevOps days. Anybody even brought it up yet? Wow. But what does the M stand for in columns or CAMS? Who remembers? Measure, measurement. So good, let's measure all the things. Why? Why are we measuring the things that we're measuring, right? We wanna make sure we're setting the proper expectations. We don't wanna say we need five nines of reliability because five is a bigger number than four. Why do you need five? How is it tied to your business metrics and your business outcomes? And likewise, your uh, speed metrics should not be faster than last month, right? Uh, I worked for, that's actually a real metric I had to deliver once, where I would put together page load times once a month that would go to the CTO to go to the board. And then after doing that for a few months, I said to my boss, I'm like, what are we trying to hit? And she said, not slower than last month. How do you, how do you work towards that? And then also make sure that you don't confuse correlation and causation. So just because your page loads slower means you get fewer leads doesn't mean making it go faster will mean more leads. 
So let's make sure we're always questioning these metrics. Why are we using them? What's the data that's driving your incident process? When you're getting incidents created from alerts, they should be based upon business outcomes, not high CPU utilization, right? Those are system level alerts. They can be helpful for diagnostic, but what matters more is how many orders are you getting per hour compared to what you normally do? Or if you're Netflix, how many stream starts per second? Amazon, how many cart disbands do you get? Like, what's going on? Are the metrics tied to business outcomes? I just talked about that, and we already talked again about how correlation does not always equal causation. I'm gonna get a little controversial about a couple things here, so keep things simple always. Uh, how many people have ever heard of the phrase uh, resume-driven development? How many people have ever been burned by that? So don't over-design your systems. Uh, because resume-driven development, which what that basically is alluding to is we're implementing new technologies or new designs because they're fun and cool and exciting and shiny, they're almost always a recipe for on-call disasters because they usually create very complex systems that are not completely understood. So um, I felt like I needed to write a law. I call this um, Stratton's Law of Catastrophic Predestination. And what this means is the very heart of every complex, resilient system is the hubris that someone thought they could think of everything that could possibly go wrong. Fate and the internet are laughing at you. So, and now it's not about how resilient the system is. Systems can be very resilient. So this is the key part of the more resiliently it's designed. And even more importantly, the more resilient it's attempted design. So do not design for any more resiliency than you absolutely need, because the more complex we make systems, the more challenging they are to support. And I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to talk to people, right? We're gonna have to talk to humans, right? So they can do things like ask them about how on-call is feeling during stand-ups, right? Give them the opportunity to mention that they might be getting burnt out. Know this, who are your customers? They may be external, they may be internal, but what are their expectations? Whose customer are you? How can you help them out, right? And then what are the perceptions of your team? This one is pretty hard because you have to kind of turn a pretty tough lens on yourself, but everybody's really good about knowing the perceptions of other teams. Be like, oh yeah, that storage team, they're always really slow about turning around requests. Or the network team is always saying no to people, right? So I'm not saying you need to send out like net promoter surveys. Maybe you should. How, uh, how likely are you to recommend the storage team, my storage team to a friend or colleague? I don't know. Could work, could work, measuring things. But you want to understand what those perceptions of your team are so you can figure out how to make them better. And these are all humans. So keep things in mind, right? Think about contextual on-call. Not all systems require the same amount of care and feeding 24 hours, seven days a week. Yes, we live in this internet economy and there's lots and lots of things like that. Maybe if you are a business that is in the continental United States or within one or two time zones, maybe your general ledger doesn't need to wake people up at two in the morning if there's a problem with it, if no one's actually using it except during business hours, right? So on-call being contextual matters a lot. Think about this, and we talked about this a little bit around code of conduct, just right, the golden rule, right? Also known as Wheaton's Law, don't be a, you know, word I shouldn't say or I'll violate the code of conduct. Um, and bake cookies, right? So it, again, these are humans, so just things to think about, right? So cookie ops is, is a thing. PageDuty's office is down the street from Slack. How many people use Slack as a critical part of how they work? How many people get really upset when Slack is having service degradation or an outage? Right, how many people have thought about that there's humans on the other end of that? How many people have sent them cupcakes? So there's just, I'm not saying everybody, because first of all, I don't think they need to get deluged with cupcakes, but <laughs> also it's a lot easier for us, they're just down the street. Uh, but bearing in mind, in fact, actually this came up in our, in our internal Slack the other day, and they said, has anybody done it, have reached out to GitHub, to the folks we know at GitHub, to give them, send them some cookies, right? Because it sucks when you're taking these outages. So things like that inside. Um, I'm gonna go over this kind of quickly, my colleague uh, Rachel, gave the workshop yesterday about incident command, so I'm gonna to touch on these just, just, just briefly. Um, you take a look at uh, the sketch notes that uh, Ashton drew, you can see some of the things, but some of the things to bear in mind. So during a call, you wanna make sure there's clearly defined roles, so you know who's doing what. 
Avoid the bystander effect, so you never say something like, can someone go check these logs? You always say, Jason, please go check the firewall logs and get back to me within five minutes. Understood. Uh, rally fast, disband faster, so get the people you need involved as quickly as possible, but get them off the call as soon as you know you don't need them. You can always get them back. And again, I talked about this before, don't litigate severity during a call. Don't argue about whether it's a well, you just work to the highest severity, you figure it out later. And have a clear mechanism for making decisions. So um, sharing all your tests. This is, this is a very DevOpsy thing when we think about Dev and Ops and a big wall of confusion and all this stuff. Right? So we do lots of testing on either side of the wall of confusion, but we don't usually share them. And what does that mean? So tests are for software engineers and site reliability engineers both. They're for Dev and Ops both. They're certainly not just for testers. They're definitely for testers, but they're for the rest of us too. So all functional tests used in pre-production should have a corresponding monitor in production. If you care enough to test it before you release it, then you must care about to make sure that it's still working, right? Monitoring is nothing but testing with a time dimension. Similarly, if you're monitoring it for in production, why aren't you testing it in your pre-production pipeline? Because one of the worst places to find out that shit's broken is production, right? You're still gonna find stuff there, but this is a really good chance to, you know, if you cared enough to create a monitor, then you care enough to write a test. And, oh, hey, look at that. Monitoring is testing with the time dimension. So there should be full parity between pre-production and production. Um, this is, if you take nothing away else away from this talk, in every uh, sprint or work item or whatever you do, do one nice thing for your on-call responders. Help your responders in each and every sprint or week or however you divide things up. You don't get out of this by saying you don't do sprints. Everyone's gonna do this, right? So in every sprint or work unit, add value to your responders. Even if there's not a JIRA ticket for it, even if it's not in the backlog and your product owner said it was okay, do it anyway, be a rebel. I give you permission, send your scrum masters after me. You can find me, I'm at Matt Stratton on Twitter, I will take them on, come at me. Here's some examples. Better context and logging. Guess what, a stack trace is not enough. Stack trace is helpful, but it doesn't give me any context about what's going on. Remove some technical debt. Sorry, not sorry, you have some. You can always chip away at technical debt. <clears throat> and that's exactly what you do with technical debt, is you chip away at it. You don't have the technical debt project. Just like when you're removing debt in your personal life, you don't sit there and say, I'm gonna stop worrying about all my other bills for the next three months and just pay off my other debt. You chip away at it, right? Add some useful tests. Uh, Jez Humble has a great anecdotal story about an organization he was working with which said, well, in every sprint, we're gonna add one more test. They ended up with a lot of tests that were assert equals true. They wrote a lot of tests. They didn't test a lot of stuff. And remove something unused. Charity Majors has a great saying, which is the best diff is a red diff. So if something is not being used, delete it. Get rid of that code. Couple other things, if you use feature flags, add a description to the configuration. I know that's not always possible. Your configuration might be JSON, sorry. Um, this is, if you use runbooks, make sure they're up to date with every single time you cut software. If you cannot do this, and it's hard, consider abandoning the runbook altogether. An out of date runbook is considered harmful. Come at me. And then simplify, right? Again, everywhere you can to make your systems more simple. They will make themselves complex for you. They don't need your help. So, I would love to hear your on-call stories. You can find me on Twitter, at Matt Stratton. I'm on the LinkedIn's um, occasionally. Uh, Rust DevOps is my podcast. I'll be around for pretty much all of the day in the open spaces in the hallway track. I love to hear great on-call stories. Please share them with me. Um, you can find uh, this talk and others at mattstratton.com slash speaking. You can also take a picture of this QR code and it should take you there. Does anybody do that? This is a test. Not a test if you're doing it right or not. <laughs> this is a test to see if it gets used. Because I was like, that's kind of a thing. Okay. And, um, and these are some of the links. You don't need to capture these as long as you remember to go to the link that I just told you. I have all of these links, but some of them are 
this uh, webinar we did about employee, where it has all the data. Um, I bought a blog, that, ah, jeez, hello. I'm your first speaker of the day. Uh, I wrote a blog post about making on-call better for the people called Page It Forward. Um, that normalization of deviance article about NASA, uh, linked to some information about snow crash. Uh, we did a great uh, episode of uh, Arrested DevOps around disasters. And then we have also open sourced our incident response process at PagerDuty. Um, it does not require the use of PagerDuty. It's just how we do things at PagerDuty to run a very highly available, highly critical system, and that's at response.pagerduty.com. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.